under certain conditions, if there's enough uh, water vapor in the air, it will turn into rain. And um, vegetation transpires water vapor and the soil also evaporates water vapor into the air. So therefore, veget vegetation and soil can impact rainfall that way. And it's a, it's a simple enough idea, but uh, it seems like it's kind of, uh, it's, it's, it's not, people are not aware of that as possibly as they maybe could be. I'm trying to see how I get to the next. So um, there's a lot of different air, different places that have had experience of uh, bringing back the rain. So in the lowest plain in China, a desert the size of Belgium was restored to growth. Um, and this happened because they helped the goats and sheep to stop eating all the vegetation. Terraces and berms were built to catch the rainfall, and a large replanting process has happened. And um, and over uh, many years, a uh, rain has come back to that region. Um, in Al Baidra, in the desert area in Saudi Arabia, they used different techniques, permaculture techniques, to catch the rainwater, and so that hydrated the uh, uh, plants. And because the atmosphere was constrained by the mountains, when the water vapor was transpired in the air, it kind of stayed in that area, so it could allow the rain to then fall back and create the small water cycle. And they also used trees to block the rain, the wind to kind of trap that water vapor. <laughs> Um, in the Mediterranean, uh, the meteorologist Milan Milan studied the impact of rainfall on land. And he noticed that as more of the nature was converted to urban lands, there was a loss of rain. And so the reverse process can also happen as we uh, reforest or re-nature uh, the urban areas, we could actually also bring back rainfall. Um, in Borneo, Willie Smiths led a restoration effort that planted about four square miles of uh, forest, and that increased the rain uh, 20 plus percentages and clouds covers 20, 10 plus percentage. Um, that's a very humid area um, there. In the Amazon, um, they looked at the water isotopes, and uh, the water isotopes showed that the water was coming from the trees rather than the oceans just before it started raining which indicated that the trees were creating rain. And it's not just the water from the oceans that are creating the rain. Hang on, I'm gonna, hang on one sec. I'm just gonna move a little bit, I'm sorry. I'm in a little bit of a noisy area. Um, in Nebraska, um, the cornfields cover about 25% of the state and the winds are high and uh, there, and so it blows the water vapor around, but still the corns have increased the rain by 30% there. Um, in Central Valley, California, uh, the aquifer is draining the water a lot um, to feed a lot of the US. But um, while California has decreased the rainfall, in the Central Valley, it looks like the, um, the rainfall has been pretty constant. So the crop transpiration may have played a role in creating some rain. <clears throat> um, in California and Israel, air pollution has led to a decrease, 15 to 25% decrease in rain downwind. So the, the air pollution creates um, small particles for the water vapor to create small um, kind of smaller condensation particles. So it kind of isn't big enough to actually create rainfall. And so that's the reason why. So there's um, a vegetation, soil, groundwater, rain feedback loop. And in the research literature, there's, there's discussion of the soil moisture precipitation couplings the groundwater precipitation couplings and the vegetation soil couplings and so and the vegetation precipitation couplings. So there's all sorts of indication, there's all sorts of feedback loops between these things. And so if we work with these feedback loops, we can increase the rain. Um, and so these feedback loops include the small water cycle where the rain goes to the soil and then to the plants and then back up to the clouds and to create rain. And it also includes the rainfall falling to go to the rivers, that then overflow into the floodplains and riverbanks to go into the trees there and then flow back up. And they, that can be for hundreds of miles this flow. <clears throat> um, and there's different feedback loops. So drought conditions can actually create worse drought conditions because you create drier soil, which then have more plants dying, which means that the even drier soil, which can't absorb the rainfall, which means you can't have the plants growing to transpire the rain back, uh, the water back up. So it's a it's a it's a problematical feedback loop, but if you can get to the tipping point where you're actually creating 
you could bring back the rain by creating more wet soil, more microbes, which then allow the soil to have more air pockets, which can then absorb more water, which can then grow more plants, which then has more dead biomass to increase the soil uh, absorbency, which then leads to more transpiration and more rain. And so you can actually, so there's different um, attractor points in dynamical systems theory um, or metastable points um, in, the, in thermodynamics. So we're trying to get them to the healthier um, uh, attractor points in the system. So the key factor is increasing rain, uh, the ability of soils to absorb the rainfall. And you can do this by increasing the soil sponginess. And then also there's different uh, permaculture techniques like swales and ponds and dead branches to divert the rainfall into the soil. Um, and then the amount of plants that transpire water vapor um, and, and that, which also cool the earth and the water condenses more easily at lower temperatures. Um, another factor is where the water and the soil flows. So the river banks and the floodplains where the oil water goes to those areas, they feed the plants there and then transpires back up to, the, um, to create rain. Um, aerosols are also an important uh, factor. The whole aerosol climate um, cloud feedback loops is a little bit um, still debated in the research literature. So while aerosols help seed the rain, they also reflect more solar radiation, which um, can sometimes increase the temperature, which lowers the rainfall. So under certain conditions, it increases rainfall and others it, others it doesn't. Um, another key factor is amount of water that we divert to big cities from rural areas, because um, say in LA, if you divert a lot of water from Owens Valley and up north, then those areas get less hydrated and those that hydration could be bringing the ecosystem, which then transpires water in the air, which creates rain. Um, so the floodplains are an important area. Um, so if we have, uh, there's like 1500 dams in California and a lot of the dams are stopping the ebb and flow of the water, which can, which would normally overflow into the floodplains. But because the dams hold the water, it doesn't happen. And so all that ecosystem that could be um, fertilized is not. And, um, and also helping with this is beavers, which build little weirs that help um, the water divert from the river into the floodplains. Um, and so one of the ways we can actually help with the um, diversion of all the water uh, to LA is to make LA itself a small water cycle. So in Burbank, they depaved a lot of concrete and building wetlands, which allows the rainwaters to seep into the into the land, clean it, and then go into the aquifers. And the plan in LA is to then build wells to bring up the water to feed its inhabitants. So if LA provides its own small water cycle, then we're gonna drain less water from else places. So creating these kind of sponge cities is kind of key too to uh, restoring the rain. So one of the projects we're trying to launch here is to kind of create the project drawdown for the water cycle. So project drawdown was a list of the top 100 methods to draw down carbon um, to help with climate change, but perhaps even more important in the carbon cycle is the water cycle. So we'd like to create and bring together a lot of experts like hopefully um, different, uh, different people in different areas of this from the permaculturists to the meteorologists to the scientists to the agroecologists and um, uh, so forth. Um, so I'm just gonna briefly just touch on some of this list. Um, there's different methods. So uh, there's the plant matter fungi bacteria methodology. So basically planting more vegetation um, has multiple benefits. It, it's, it's what helps evaporate the water in the sky. It's what helps guide the water into the soil. It, it provides the biomass for the microbes to eat and, um, and the mi microbes multiply to create the soil. Um, mycelia can help funnel water to different plants within the soil. Um, the dead biomass uh, is useful to create healthier soils and placing dead branches and leaves in the path of down, downhill rainfall helps guide it into the soil. Um, in certain areas, the plants are drawing up too much water and that throws off the ecosystem there. So you can replace almonds, salt, cedar, various things with less uh, water hungry uh, plants. And then there's also organic matter in the sky. There's certain bacteria, fungi, pollen that's in the sky that can help seed rain. Um, and it's a debated how much significance that has actually. Um, 
So also uh, we want to create healthy soils through this various permaculture, agroecology, regenerative agriculture techniques from crop rotation, mulching, non-tilling, mycelia, compost teas, worm farming, animal poop, biodigesters, reusing sediment from one area for another. So um, those are good techniques. And so a lot of people doing say permaculture and agroecology are not always aware, but they actually are influenced in the climate and the weather cycles. Um, there's a lot of earthworks things that you can do from swales, weirs, small ponds, terracing, key line systems, rocks, guiding downhill rainfall to seep into the ground. So um, those techniques. Um, and there's en animal engineers from beavers and prairie dogs, which are loosening, loosening up the soil to cattle, which uh, help push the vegetation in the soil and also help the soil become more absorbent. Earthworms, mussels, which clean the water systems, dung beetles, wild donkeys. Um, and then the man-made structures are also real important. Um, we want to undo some of these structures. So there's dams we can undo that help water flow into the floodplains, uh, take down concrete riverbanks. Hydropower stations potentially weaken the water velocity, which then carves the river arcs. Um, Depaving parking lots and roads and putting and rewilding them would then help. Um, and unpiping some of these water structures that are transporting water to cities um, and then getting the cities to have small water cycles themselves. Um, there's certain structures that help in the, in the water system, gray water, fog nets, rain barrows. And then there's all sorts of urban stuff we can do from uh, uh, green rooftops, community food forests. I won't go through all that whole list. Um, I think the big one is to create wetlands in our cities that or to create sponge cities that are um, absorbing a lot of the rainfall that we can also then uh, create the small water cycle. Um, and then in the sewage system, um, if we can kind of uncouple the sewage from the water system, and so that can also be very helpful. And there's all sorts of techniques there. And then we wanna restore um, a lot of these areas from the wetlands to the coastal systems and so forth.